manuscript releases we're going to deal with Revelation 18 <clears throat> manuscript releases volume 13 page 334 says I stated that I was a stockholder and could not let the resolu resolution pass and that there was to be special light for God's people as they neared the closing scenes of earth's history brothers and sisters there is going to be special light we've spe specifically been told that Another angel was to come down from heaven with a message. There's special light connected with Revelation 18 verse 1. And the whole earth was to be lightened with his glory. It would be impossible for us to state just how this additional light would come. It might come in a very unexpected manner in a way that would not agree with the ideas that many have conceived. It is not at all unlikely or contrary to the ways and works of God to send light to his people in unexpected ways. There's going to be light connected with the angel of Revelation 18 verse 1 and it isn't going to come in the way that most people in Adventism expect it to come. That's what I read there. She wouldn't, she wouldn't make those inferences if she wasn't trying to say something to us. Because we're going to begin to make some claims about Revelation 18 verse 1 that probably 99% of the people in Adventism think is a bunch of foolishness if they heard it. Most of them haven't heard it, but those many that have do I think it's foolishness. Review and Herald, December 15, 1885. The dust and rubbish of error have been buried, have buried the precious jewels of truth, but the Lord's workers can uncover these treasures so that thousands will look upon them with delight and awe. Angels of God will be beside the humble worker giving grace and divine enlightenment, and thousands will be led to pray with David, Open thy, thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Truths that have been, hid, been for ages unseen and unheeded will blaze forth from the illuminated pages of God's holy word. The churches generally that have heard, refused, and trampled upon the truth will do more wickedly. But the wise, those who are honest in heart, will understand. That's my favorite comment about the foolish virgins in the spirit of prophecy. The wise virgins are the ones that have honest hearts. You know, I've, I've bumped heads with many people in Adventism over these prophetic truths, and, and many of them, you can't, you can't know their motives, you can't judge. But by the, the controversy that takes place, I just walk away from those, those times thinking, that they're just not honest. You know, they're just not being honest. You can, you can take them to a passage, and you can read it, and then they refuse to acknowledge that that's what it says, because if they acknowledge that, then they'd have to go to the next step and the next step. And they just don't have an honest heart. And the, the wise virgins are going to have an honest heart. The book is open, and the words of God reach the hearts of those who desire to know his will. At the loud cry of the angel from heaven who joins the third angels, thousands will awake from the stupor that has held the world for ages and will see the beauty and value of truth. <clears throat> the loud cry. Sometimes we miss it, and I, for me this is important to understand. The loud cry represents a progressive increase of knowledge. Okay? It, 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 when Sister White says in 1888 that the loud cry of the third angel's message has already begun in the message of righteousness that Jones and Wagner brought, She's saying the loud cry had begun there, but the loud cry represents a progressive development of truth. The truth for this time, the third angel's message is to be proclaimed with a loud voice, meaning with increasing power as we approach the great final test. The present truth for this time comprises the messages, the third angel's messages succeeding the first and second. The presentation of this message with all it embraces is our work. We stand as the remnant people in these last days to promulgate the truth and swell the cry of the third angel's wonderful distinct message, giving the trumpet a certain sound. Eternal truth, which we have adhered to from when? The beginning is to be maintained with all its increasing importance till the close of probation. That's the beginning truth, and it's to be adhered to, and it's going to increase. Those beginning truths shown as the sun, but at the end they're going to show, show, shine ten times brighter than the sun. It's an increase of knowledge. 
This message is to come to the churches. We are to consider the best plans for accomplishing this. Faith, eternal faith in the past and present truth is to be talked, is to be prayed, is to be presented with pen and vo voice. The third angel's message in its clear, definite terms is to be made the prominent warning. All that it comprehends is to be made intelligible to the reasoning minds of today. <clears throat> truth is progressive. Signs of the Times, May 26, 1881. The Word of God presents special truths for some ages. There's a special truth for this time period. Special truths for every age. The dealings of, God's, of God with His people in the past should receive our careful attention. We dealt with this a little this week. Every reform movement of, pa of the past is prefiguring and illustrating the reform movement of the 144,000. We should learn the lessons which they are designed to teach us, we, but we are not to rest content with them. God is leading out a people, his people step by step. Truth is progressive. The earnest sinker will be constantly receiving light from heaven. What is truth should be our inquiry. And here we have the Revelation 18 verses 1 through 5. We've looked at this this week. The angels in Revelation represent the work that the people of God do. We've, we've had several quotes where Sister White says that. When it comes to the three angels of Revelation 14, it's representing the work that the people of God do when those angels come into history. The angels of Revelation 18, and there are two angels, are representing the work that God's people do. In verse 1 of Revelation 18, a mighty angel comes down out of heaven and the earth is lightened with his glory. And in verse 2, he cries mightily, Babylon is fallen. But in verse 4 it says, And I heard another voice. There's two angels in Revelation 18. The first is in eight, verses 1 through 3. The second is verse 4. And the voice of the angel in verse 4 says, Come out of her, my people. This is the Sunday law in the United States. We're going to try to show that today, if you're not familiar with that. And why that is important is this. If the other voice of Revelation 18 verse 4 is identifying the Sunday law in the United States, then it means the mighty angel of Revelation 18 verse 1 comes down out of heaven before the Sunday law in the United States. Notice the next quote. Review and Herald, July 5th, 1906. Now comes the word. Where is Brother Leo? Is he the one that received the phone call? What did he walk out for? <laughs> Maybe he walked out because he read the notes. We have something for you on this quote, but we'll pass. We'll have to come back to it. We have a visual aid for this quote. All right. And he wanted to use that visual aid. So we'll get back to it at some other time. This is an important quote. Now comes the word that I've declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave. This I have never said. I have said as I looked at the great buildings going up there story after story, what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Then, then the words of Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3 will be fulfilled. The whole of the 18th chapter of Revelation is a warning of what is coming on the earth, but I have no light in particular in regard to what is coming on New York. Only I know that one day there are great buildings in New York will be thrown down by the turning and overturning of God's power. From the light given me, I know that destruction is in the world. One word from the Lord, one touch of his mighty powers, and these massive structures will fall scenes will take place, the fearfulness of which we cannot imagine. Read that quote a few times. What that means is when the great buildings of New York City came down, Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3 was fulfilled. When the great buildings of New York City came down, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 descended. We're going to deal with that for the rest of the day. Notice the next page, page 13. The latter rain is to fall upon the people of God. A mighty angel is to come down from heaven and the whole earth is to be lightened with his glory. The reason I have this quote, so you can understand the logic, 
is when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down, according to inspiration, that's when the latter rain begins to fall. Where's our, where's our chart of, that we want to illustrate for this quote, my brother? Okay, so the latter rain is, is to fall upon the people of God. A mighty angel is to come down from heaven and the whole earth is to be lightened with his glory. When the, when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down, the latter rain begins. I want you to acknowledge that if you would. All right? Are we ready to take part in the glorious work of the third angel? Are, are our vessels ready to receive the heavenly dew? Have we defilement in sin and in heart. If so, let us cleanse the temple and prepare for the showers of the latter rain. The refreshing from the presence of the Lord will never come upon hearts filled with impurity. May God help us to die to self that Christ, the hope of glory, may be formed within. What I want you to see here is that the latter rain is also the refreshing. And the latter rain and the refreshing begins when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. Now, you just stay up here for a second, all right? No, don't, don't put that up there yet. Now go back to the... Go back to the quote. Now, Brother Leo, the reason that him and I are dealing with this, this illustration is because he does this illustration on his computer and it's very nice on the computer. It, it, it comes across... It'll come across better on the computer than what it, how it's going to come across here, okay? But let me read this quote back on page 12 again. Now comes the word that I've declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave. This I've never said. I have said as I looked at the great buildings. This is New York City. This is the skyline. Do you see the great buildings? Okay. I have said as I looked at the great buildings going up there story after story what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Then the words of Revelation 18 will be fulfilled. I have no line in particular in regard to what is coming on New York, only that I know one day the great buildings there will be thrown by the turning and overturning of God's power. So this is the great buildings and that she says will come down when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. Do you see the great buildings here? Do you? Do you? Okay, Brother Leo. There's the skyline before 9-11. Do you see the great buildings of New York City? Those are the great buildings of New York City. And on September 11, 2001, the great buildings of New York City came down. And the mighty angel of Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3 came down. And those verses began to be fulfilled. The light of Revelation 18 may come in a way that is unexpected. Alright, that's where we started this presentation with. First quote in the notes. I have... Uh, it would be impossible for us to state just how this additional light would come. It might come in a very unexpected manner in a way that would not agree with the ideas that many have conceived. Okay. Now, that, the brothers and sisters... We were teaching, what we're going to teach you about Islam here today. Our teachings on this is a matter of public record. There's a brother, there's a bro brother in the United States today that is on a war path trying to demonstrate why what I teach is a bunch of delusion and heresy, all right? And he takes the fact that I deal with this statement and he, he conveys the idea that I build everything I say about Islam off of this statement. But the teachings that we do on Islam are a matter of public record. And everything that we're going to teach you about Islam that we understand today, we were teaching before we knew of this quote. Okay? It's public record. This came after the fact. This quote works very nicely. We do use it now. But you can demonstrate everything without this quote. Alright? So, back to page 13. Let me give you a preview of where we're going. August 11th, 1840. The 391 year, 15 day time prophecy of Revelation 9.15 was fulfilled when there was a restraint put upon Islam. Okay? What we're saying is, 
is that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. Therefore, on 9-11-2001, there was a restraint put upon Islam. When Sister White comments upon August 11th, 1840, in the Great Controversy, and we're going to look at that quote, what she says happened is, the, is that the rules of interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates was seen to be correct. And a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. The rules of interpretation that were important, that were the foundation to the Millerite movement, was the year-day principle. And on August 11, 1840, by applying the year-day principle to the 391-year, 15-day time prophecy, the world recognized that the principle that the Millerites was using was absolutely accurate. The rule, the rule for God's people at the end of the world is not the year day principle. Time is no longer. The rule that puts power to the prophetic message at the end, it's, it's one rule. It's the most important rule. You know what that rule is? It's that the Millerite history is repeated in the history of the 144,000. That Jesus illustrates the end of something from the beginning. And the beginning of Adventism illustrates the end of Adventism. That's why he opens up the fact that every reform movement parallels every other reform movement because when you bring all the lines of the reforms together, what they're doing is illustrating the reform movement of the 144,000. And brothers and sisters, on September 11, 2001, George Bush went to the United, the United Nations and put a restraint upon Islam that parallels the restraint that was placed upon Islam on August 11, 1840. And the rule that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter was confirmed the same way the rule that was important to the Millerites was confirmed at the very event on August 11, 1840. And just as the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down, when the great buildings of New York City came down, so did the Revelation 18 angel come down. And a work began because the angels in Revelation represent the work that the people of God do. So, top of page 13. The latter rain starts when the mighty angel comes down and the latter rain is also the refreshing. So when Sister White says the great buildings of New York City come down and then Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3 is fulfilled. Whenever the great buildings of New York City come down, not only does the mighty angel comes da come down, but in prophetic terminology, the latter rain, the refreshing, begins to sprinkle. Notice the next quote. Testimonies, volume 5, page 214. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. It is left with us to remedy the defects in our characters, to cleanse the soul defilement of every def soul temple of every defilement. Then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Brothers and sisters, the latter rain begins to fall when the sealing of the 144,000 begins. When the mighty angel comes down, the sealing process begins. At Pentecost, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out without measure. At the Sunday Law, the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out without measure upon those men and women in Adventism that have the seal of God. It's at the Sunday Law where we, where we demonstrate where we have a character prepared for the mark of the beast or the seal of God. It's at the Sunday Law where the church is purified and those Adventists that have the seal of God then receive the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's why Sister White's comparing here in Testimonies, Volume 5, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with Pentecost. But most of us don't understand that at Pentecost, there was a sprinkling of the latter rain that preceded the full outpouring. And that's what we're saying about September 11, 2001. The sprinkling begins. Verse 4 of Revelation 18 is the Sunday law. That's where the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit takes place. Notice the next quote. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 243. The act of Christ in breathing upon his disciples the Holy Ghost and imparting his peace to them was as a few drops before the plentiful shower to be given on the day of Pentecost. There's a sprinkling of the latter rain that precedes the full outpouring. And on September 11, 2001, the mighty angel came down out of heaven and the sprinkling of the latter rain, the sealing of the 144,000, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the 
testing process of Adventism began. Brothers and sisters, every reform movement is the same. They're all the same. Sister White says that. Okay? Moses parallels John the Baptist. He parallels William Miller. There was a point when Moses' message was empowered. Exodus 4, verse 24, says that when Moses was coming back to Egypt, the Lord met him. Okay, the Lord came down to Moses. And why did the Lord meet Moses on his way back to Egypt in Exodus 4, 24? Because Moses hadn't circumcised his son. So, in the Bible, is circumcision a test? Yeah, see, when the Lord came down to Moses, there was a test that was noted. The test begins there. When the divine symbol comes down, the testing process begins. How about in the reform movement of Christ? John the Baptist's message was empowered when the dove came down on Christ. Is that a divine symbol coming down out of heaven? At the baptism, the message is empowered. What does Jesus immediately do? He goes in the wilderness to be tested. In 1840, John goes and takes the little book and eats it. You read Ezekiel 2, verse 10, on through chapter 3, and you'll find that when a prophet eats a little book, it's identifying a testing message that is to be carried to God's people. And then read Jeremiah 15, and you will find that when a prophet eats the word of God, it's identifying a testing message given to God's people. And when the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down and the Millerites went and took the book, it's marking that the testing of the Millerites began. When the divine symbol comes down, the testing process begins. And on September 11, 2001, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 descended, and the testing of Adventism began in agreement with all the reform lines. And the testing of Adventism is the sealing of the 144,000. It's the latter rain. It's the refreshing. And it's very defendable by God's word. Now notice testimonies to ministers, page 507. If you don't think there's a sprinkling of the latter rain, you, you'll really have a, a hard time putting some of Sister White's statements into perspective. But there must be no neglect of the grace represented by the former reign. Only those who are living up to the, to the light they have will receive greater light. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. There's a time period when the latter reign is falling upon Adventists, and some of us are receiving it, and some of us aren't. And those that aren't receiving it, they don't even know it's falling. But nevertheless, at that point in time, the wheat and the tares of Adventism, they're still together because the latter rain is falling on all of them. But at the Sunday law, the wheat and tares are separated. Sister White's identifying a time in Adventism when the latter rain begins to sprinkle and only the wise virgins receive it. The foolish virgins don't even know it's happening. So if you're tempted to listen to what we're saying here about September 11, 2001 and think that it's a bunch of foolishness, brothers and sisters, you shouldn't be tempted that way. What you should be tempted to do is listen to what is said and then go home and test it and make sure that if it's wrong, that you know it's wrong. Because if it's right, you don't want to not understand that it's right. This is the ceiling of the 144,000. This is the shaking. When Sister White talks about a shaking, all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. The shaking of Adventism, that every reference to the shaking of Adventism in the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy is referring to, is the shaking of Adventism during the sealing of the 144,000, during the sprinkling of the latter rain, and it has to do with returning to the foundationals, foundational truths. We're here. Because it's almost impossible to convince those of us that are sleeping in a Laodicean condition that we're really here. But we are. Review and Herald, July 20th, 1897. Remember, the parable of the ten virgins has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. The anointed one standing before the Lord of the whole earth had the position once given to Satan as the covering cherub. By the holy beings surrounding the thrones, the Lord keeps up a constant communication with the inhabitants of the earth. The golden oil represents the grace with which God keeps the lamps of the believers supplied. That 
they shall not flicker and go out. Were it not for this holy oil is poured out from heaven and the messages of God's spirit, the agents of, agencies of evil would have entire control over men. God is dishonored when we do not receive the communications which he sends to us. Thus we refuse the golden oil. The latter rain is a message, brothers and sisters. We handed out a paper here this week that I doubt many of you have had time to read yet, but it identifies that the latter rain is a message. Adventists at the end of the world, we think it's, it's an empowerment. The latter rain is an empowerment, and when someone stands before them and they say, oh, you're saying it's a message, I'm not so sure about that. But every Adventist knows it's a message. Didn't Jones and Wagner bring the latter rain message? Wasn't Jones and Wagner's message the latter rain message, was it? Yes. Was it rejected? Yes. It wasn't listened to. It's a message. The latter rain is delivered to God's people through the golden oil, which is the communications that he sends to us. And how does he send the communication to us? Through the two golden pipes, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. It's a message. It's light that he opens up. When the lion of the tribe of Judah, the dirt brush man, begins to unseal the message that tests this generation, he brings them light. Now notice this next quote on page 14. This is a scary quote. Bible Echo, August 26, 1895. There are lessons to be learned from the history of the past. And attention is called to these that all may understand that God works on the same lines now that he has ever done. The same lines. The line of the Millerites. The line of Belshazzar. The line of Nebuchadnezzar. The line of Christ. The line of Noah. The line of Moses. The line of the three decrees. There's lessons to be learned from history. He always does the same thing on these lines of history. Now notice what she says. His hand is seen in his work and among the nations now just the same as it has been ever since the gospel was first proclaimed to Adam and Eden. There are periods in which there are periods which are turning points in the history of nations and of the church. Was September 11th, 2001 a turning point in the history of the United States? Was it a turning point in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Yes. In the providence of God, when these different crises arrive, what does it say? The light for that time is given. September 11, 2001 was the crisis where the light was given because that's when the great buildings of New York City were thrown down and the mighty angel comes down out of heaven and the earth is lightened with his glory. In the providence of God, when these different crises arrive, the light for that time is given. If it is received, and here's the scary part, there is spiritual progress. If it is rejected, spiritual declension and shipwreck follow. The testing of Adventism is underway. And there's going to be two classes demonstrated in the very near future. The wise and foolish virgin. The terminology of Daniel 12, the wise and the wicked. The Lord in his word has opened up the aggressive work of the gospel as it has been carried out in the past and will be in the future, even to the closing conflict when satanic ad agencies will make their last wonderful movement. From that word, we understand that the forces are now at work that will usher in the last great conflict between good and evil, between Satan, the prince of darkness, and Christ, the prince of life. The seed of Satan, the seed of the serpent. This is the everlasting gospel. But the coming triumph for men who love and fear God is as sure as that throne that his throne is established in the heavens. Revelation 18 verse 4 is the Sunday law in the United States. Notice two distinct calls. So in the last work for the warning of the world, two distinct calls are made to the church churches. The second angel's message is Babylon has fallen. Dropping beyond that, it says, And in the loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Two distinct calls are given to the churches. There's two temple cleansings. The temple is cleansed by the manifestation of the power of God. There was a manifestation of the power of God on, on September 11, 2001. It begins a cleansing process where right here, Right, right here, the Sunday law in the United States. And the Sunday law is where the door closes on Adventism, brothers and sisters. Man, Jesus cleansed the temple by divinity flashing through humanity on September 11, 2001. Even if people aren't willing to see it, on September 11, 2001, divinity flashed through humanity and began, people began to flee out of the temple. 
And that period of cleaning and cleansing the temple comes to a conclusion when the door closes at the Sunday law. There's two temple cleansings. When the Sunday law cleanses the Seventh-day Adventist church, then the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure in the loud cry. The true loud cry. The, the, the perfect loud cry. And that manifestation of the power of God cleanses the temple outside of Adventism. And that cleansing is complete when this door closes. When judgment concludes and Michael stands up. Now, brothers and sisters, there was two temple cleansings in the history of the Millerites. There was a manifestation of the power of God on August 11th, 1840. Divinity flashed through humanity. And the temple began to be cleansed. And in June of 1842, the door closed on the Protestants. Now, brothers and sisters, take note. Take note, please. On August 11th, 1840, the principle the Millerites were using was confirmed. The year-day principle. On September 11, 2001, the fact that the Millerite history is being repeated was confirmed because on August 11, 1840, there was a restraint put upon Islam. And on September 11, 2001, there was a restraint placed upon Islam. Parallel histories. The testing process began. Divinity, divinity flashes through humanity, humanity and the temple cleansing. The first is underway. And by June of 1842, a door closes. Who's the door closed on? Where's the door closed? Who's associated with the closing door? The Protestants, Protestants of the USA, right? Say amen if that's what you understand. Here, the a mighty angel comes down, divinity flashes through humanity, the temple's being cleansed, and the door closes when? When the Protestants in the USA pass the Sunday law. Do you see it? This is the arrival of the second angel's message in this history. In this history here, there's another time when divinity flashes through humanity. It's called the midnight cry. And the midnight cry, it reaches its conclusion on October 22nd, 1844, when the door is closed into the holy place and judgment begins. And in this history, the midnight cry here is paralleling the loud cry here. And the second temple cleansing. And this temple cleansing ends when the door closes and judgment ends. This door closes when judgment begins. This door closes when judgment ends. Brothers and sisters, this is an absolute repeat of the Millerite history and a film fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. And in this history, when the mighty angel comes down, the testing of Adventism is underway. Notice page 15. I, 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 I got to go, I gotta go, I go back to page 14. I, I remembered why I had to read this quote. <laughs> when you see the call come out of her, my people, that's the Sunday law in the United States. If you use that phrase and check the spirit of prophecy writings, you'll see that she refers to Revelation 18.14 in association with the Sunday law. Okay? So verse 4 in Revelation 18 is the Sunday law. Therefore, verses 1 through 3 is something, a history that takes place before the Sunday law. Pardon me, 18.4. The sins of the world have reached unto heaven when the law of God is made void. And you'll notice that in Revelation 18 verses 4 and 5 it says her sins have reached unto heaven. It's at the Sunday law that her sins reach unto heaven. That's when the call come out of her, my people, arrives. So Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3 is a history that comes and leads up to the Sunday law. Okay, now on the next page. First and second angels' message repeated. The whole earth is to be lightened with the glory of the Lord. The pure in heart shall see God. It is those who are following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth that will receive power from that angel that came down from heaven having great power. The first message is to be repeated, proclaiming the second advent of Christ to our world. The second angel's message is to be repeated. We've showed you how it was repeated. The first angel's message arrived in 1798 at the time of the end. The second angel's message arrived in 1842 when the Protestants closed their door against that message. The first message for us here at the end of the world began when the dirt brush man opened the windows and began to sweep out the rubbish, unsealing the seven thunders, the prophetic truth for this generation. And this message began to test Adventism. It was empowered on September 11, 2001. And the next thing to happen is the arrival of the, the perfect fulfillment of the second angel's message at the Sunday law. 
Okay, that's, that's the repetition. You see a very good quote underneath that. The says on, on 1888 materials, the first and second angels' message are still truth for this time. This history and this history are truth for this time, and they are to run parallel with that which follows. What follows the second angels' message is the third angels' message. And the third angel's message is to run parallel with this history. So if you take the, the arrival of the third angel's message in 1844 and you bring it down here, you can show a parallel history for the third angel's message. Airtight parallel history. Time of the end, book of Daniel unsealed. Time of the end, the dirt brush man appears. Increase of knowledge, increase of knowledge. Message empowered when an angel comes down. Message empowered when an angel comes down. First temple cleansing begins. Door closes on Protestants. Door closes on Protestants. Another manifestation of the power of God. Another manifestation of the power of God. Door, second door closes. Second temple cleansing. Second door closes. That's what Sister White's speaking about in these passages. Revelation 14 is repeated. Matthew 25 is repeated. Daniel 12 is repeated. It's repeated in Revelation 18. We've been dealing with Jeremiah... <laughs> There's no way I'm going to finish this in 10 minutes. But we've been dealing with Jeremiah 6, verses 16 and 17. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll finish it. We're not going to get behind on this one. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. If you weren't here the first night, brothers and sisters, go to Isaiah 28, 12, please. Prophets all agree with one another. 1 Corinthians 14, 32. The spirit of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. Verse 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion. If the prophets were speaking with different messages than one another, the Bible would be confusing. Confusing. And Jeremiah says, When we walk in the old paths, when we walk in the foundational truth, we will find rest to our souls. And in verse 12 of, of Isaiah 28, it says, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. This is the rest with where you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Another prophet, Ellen White, more than once, and you can look at it in Great Controversy 611, but in other places, she says the refreshing is the latter rain. So Isaiah 28, 12 here is saying that the, ref the rest and the refreshing, they both represent the latter rain. And Isaiah is always also saying it's a message. Because the rest and the refreshing is something that one group in Adventism refuses to hear. But when Jeremiah says, if you walk in the old path, you shall find rest for your souls, he's saying that when the Lord returns God's people to the old paths, that's where you find the latter rain. That's where you find the rest. That's where you find the refreshing. And you may not remember it, some of you may not have been here, but in each of these histories, they're always the same. And in the history of this first way mark, every time, the foundation is laid. Okay, every time. Miller laid the foundations that are represented on these charts. John the Baptist laid the foundational message for his, his history. Noah built the, the structure that he built the ark on. He laid the foundation right at the beginning of his work. The foundational message for Moses was Sabbath because the message was the Lord is going to take his people out to worship. And the foundation of worship is the Sabbath. The foundation is always laid in the first way mark. It was in the first decree of Cyrus that the foundation of the temple was completed. And the, the first way mark in our history is to return to the foundation. That's our foundational work. That's the old past. That's where you find the rest. That's where you find the refreshing. And that's why in Isaiah 28, or Isaiah 58, go to Isaiah 58, 12. Isaiah 58, 12 says this, And they that shall be of these shall build up the old waste places and shall raise up the what? Foundations in the plural of many generations. At the end of the world, the 144,000 are going to demonstrate that every reform movement is the same and that in every reform movement, in the, in the first way mark, the foundations are established because in Isaiah 58, 12, those people that raise up the foundations of many generations are going to be proving that the foundational work for the 144,000 is to repair the breach and restore the past to dwell in. And what are the past to dwell in? According to Jeremiah, they're the old paths and they're where you find the rest, which is the latter rain. Alright, but in verse 17, back to your notes, there's a secondary argument. But they said, we will not walk therein. Verse 17, I also set watchmen over you 
saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpets. But they said, We will not hearken. Now, brothers and sisters, the message that empowered the Millerite movement was a prophecy from the sixth trumpet, the second woe. The fulfillment of the 391 year, 15 day time prophecy is a time prophecy of the sixth trumpet, the second woe. This is, this is the message that empowered that history. It was the trumpet message for that time period. It confirmed the year day principle. So what we're saying is that when this history is repeated, that the third woe arrived in history and this final message was empowered. And it's real simple. Even a child can understand this. There are three woes. If you uphold the pioneer position, the first woe is Islam. The second woe is Islam. So what's the third woe? Islam. It's the trumpet message. But when you identify September 11, 2001 as the arrival of Islam in end time Bible prophecy, by and large in Adventism, they will say, we will not listen to the sound of that trumpet. So the pioneer position of the trumpets, you have the trumpets there. They identify and you have Bible references that a trumpet in the Bible is used to announce an assembly, alarm, a holy convocation, deliverance, and a day of wrath and distress. You will see a quote from William Miller that identifies that the trumpets mark the downfall of an empire. Okay? You have that quote there. Um, all you have to do is break open your eyes, Miss Book, Daniel, and Revelation, and he, I'm on page 16. He'll explain to us that the first trumpet was Alaric, 395. The second trumpet, Genseric. Third, Attila the Hun. Fourth, Odiacer. By the fourth trumpet, Western Rome was disintegrated into the ten kingdoms that Daniel 7 predicted. In 476, this was accomplished by these first four trumpets. They brought down the empire of Western Rome in agreement with the pioneer understanding. That's the first four trumpets. Next page. The fifth trumpet is Islam. You can see Sister White's, not Sister White's, your eyes miss comments on it there under the first woe, which is also the fifth trumpet. The sixth trumpet is the Islam of Turkey, of the Ottoman Empire. And you can see... Uriah Smith's comments on it there. But one thing, one caveat to the sixth trumpet, the second woe. The first one, the second woe, are primarily Islam. But it isn't until Revelation 11, verse 14. Turn there if you were, it would. It says, the second woe is past. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Revelation 11, verse 14. So although the second woe, the sixth trumpet, is primarily dealing with the role of Islam, the second woe includes the history of the French Revolution. Verse 14 says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the point is this, that in the history of the second woe, you also have the history of the French Revolution. In the history of the second woe, the sixth trumpet, Eastern Rome and Constantinople is destroyed. An empire is brought down. 1453. First time in history. Yeah first, yeah, first time in history that gunpowder was used in warfare. But also in that same history, you have Papal Rome being brought down. The pioneers taught that the trumpets were the providential forces that brought down Rome. The first four trumpets brought down Western Rome by 476. The sixth trumpet brought down Eastern Rome, 1453, and it also brought down Papal Rome, 1798. The trumpets represent the historical forces that bring down Rome, and the fifth and sixth trumpet are the first and second woe. The pioneers, in, in the first and second woe, there is a sealing time illustrated. In Revelation 9, verse 4, the history of the first woe, it says, and I'm on page 17 under the first woe, it says, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men who had not the seal of God in their foreheads. Revelation 9 here is dealing with the warfare that was brought against Rome by Islam in the history of Muhammad and onward. And in verse 4, there's a command to not hurt those that have the seal of God. And the first general after Muhammad was a man named Abu Bakr, and Abu Bakr's command is still a historical document. 
He said to his Islamic warriors, when you go out and attack Rome, you're going to find two kind of Christians. Basically, to keep it simple, you're going to find Catholic Christians. You make them submit to Muhammad or you kill them. But you're going to find another kind of Christian living out in the country. You leave them alone. And the distinction between those two Christians is that the Sunday keeping Christians were the Catholics and the Christians that they were to leave alone were the Sabbath keeping Christians. Verse 4 is identifying a sealing process in, verse, in, in the first woe. There's also a sealing process identified in the second woe. Why is that important? You'll see why that's important as we move just a little bit further. The first woe and the second woe have a specific sealing process that's identified. The pioneers were wrong about the second woe. This really causes people to stumble. The pioneers believed that the second woe, the sixth trumpet, ended on August 11th, 1840. But it didn't. It ended on October 22nd, 1844. The pioneers were so obsessed, and I mean in a good way, not in a negative way, with the negative way, with the 391 year, 15 day time prophecy of the second woe that when it reached its conclusion, they couldn't see beyond that. They, it didn't fit in for them. But brothers and sisters, there was a prophet before Sister White. His name was William Foy. And you have his comment here on the bottom of page 17. And it, the pioneers that wrote pamphlets and books to, in, to uphold that Sister White was given the true spirit of prophecy, they always include dealing with William Foy and identify that he also was given the true spirit of prophecy. You may not understand that, but that's pioneer understanding. That was not a satanic counterfeit that had encompassed William Foy. It was the genuine manifestation of the spirit of prophecy. And he recorded his visions. And in 1842, after 1840, in 1842, this is part of what he said. Near the place through which we passed, I beheld a mighty angel clothed in pure white raiment, having a crown of brightness on his head. He appeared to be gazing through the bar, and his eyes, like lamps of fire, were fixed with steadfastness, steadfastness upon the earth. He stood with his right foot placed before him as though walking, and his object appeared to be to reach the earth. But three steps remained for him to take. Against his breast and across his left hand were, as it were, a trumpet of pure silver. And a great and terrible voice came from the midst of the boundless place, saying, The sixth angel has not yet done sounding. The sixth angel, the sixth trumpet, the second woe, was still sounding in 1842. And it ended in 1844 when the seventh trumpet began to sound. Now, that doesn't seem important until you understand that 1840 to 1844 is a history that's part of the second woe. And 1840 to 1844 is an illustration of the sealing of the 144,000. So in the first woe, in Revelation 9-4, and in the history of the second woe, you have an illustration of the sealing of the 144,000. And when you bring those two lines of prophecy together, it's saying that when the third woe arrives in history on September 11, 2001, in the crisis that's brought upon the world by Islam, that's when the sealing of the 144,000 begins. So, Ramos, Ramos through. On page 18, under the empowerment of the message of the hour, this is J.N. Andrews. He's, he's not correct on the sixth trumpet. He thought it ended in 1840, but he says something that we want to at least put in the record. The termination of the hour, day, month, and year of the sixth angel marks the conclusion of the second woe, August 11th, 1840. That's not true, but that's pioneer understanding. At the close of the sixth angel's voice, a mighty angel descends from heaven to herald the sounding of the seventh trumpet. The pioneers understood that the angel of Revelation 10 came down on August 11th, 1840. All right, I just want to put that in the record. That's what he's saying. This mighty angel he is to herald 1844. This is what he believes to be the seventh trumpet. But that mighty angel is part of the sixth trumpet. Underneath that, you have Sister White placing her, her endorsement upon the pioneer understanding of the 391 year 15 day time prophecy that came to a conclusion on August 11th 1840. Now brothers and sisters there are nine direct places in the writings of Ellen White. Nine direct places where she places her endorsement upon the pioneer understanding of the sixth trumpet. And anyone that's fair-minded in their analysis of the pioneer understanding of the trumpets knows for certain 
that there's no way that you separate the first five trumpets from the six. The pioneers understood that the trumpets represented a progressive history that brought down Rome. You can't just grab one of them and say, oh, well, I accept this trumpet as the pioneers understood it, but not any the other. They're a unit of thought. All right? So when Sister White places her endorsement upon the sixth trumpet, she's placing her endorsement upon the pioneer understanding of the trumpets. That's why it's alarming. But today, we're teaching that we no longer accept the pioneer understanding of the trumpets. You have it in one of your handouts, if you're not aware of that, from the highest levels of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We no longer understand the trumpets as the pioneers do. We're not listening to, we're not going to hearken to the sound of the trumpet. We stepped off the foundation, but more important, we've decided that those nine direct places that Sister White places her endorsement upon the pioneer's understanding of the trumpet not valid. That's how I understand it. I'm often referred... Okay. How many are familiar with the triple application of prophecy? Okay. This is the Millerite history. Let me... I, I, I want to show you a triple application of prophecy before we get... These are, these are nice. All right. Triple application of prophecies are nice. They're easy to see. They're easy to see. Yeah, I'm making you get up, right? What I want you to remember... Yeah, that, that's fine. How many have seen from the references this week that the Millerite history is repeated in the history of the 144,000? If you understand that, say amen. amen. Good, all right. So, one of the things that happened in this history is that the Lord used William Miller to assemble the foundational truths that are on this chart, right? And the Lord gave William Miller a key. What's the key? No, no, it wasn't just the year-day principle, but that's a good answer. It was the, the entire package, all the rules of prophetic interpretation adopted by William Miller. How many rules were there? Fourteen rules, okay? That was the key that unlocked these things. Sister White says those that are proclaiming the third angel's message are studying up on the same plan adopted by Father Miller. That's almost word for word. So we should understand there was 14 rules and we should understand what they were. But the point of, that I want you to see is that in order to identify and establish the message for this generation, the Millerites were given certain rules of Bible prophecy. The primary one is the year-day principle. Where do we first find the year-day principle in the Bible? Numbers. Moses, right? So the year-day principle has been in the Bible for hundreds and hundreds of years before William Miller arrives on the scene. And when William Miller arrives on the scene, the year-day principle changes from truth to present truth. Now here's a rule that changes from truth to present truth. It's a rule that has to be applied for this generation to open up the word and the message that's going to test them. Therefore, if the Millerite history is going to be repeated to the very letter, it would be a valid consideration to believe that there will be certain rules of Bible prophecy that will be recognized at the end of the world that allow the 144,000 to identify and establish the special message for their generation. One of those rules is called a triple application of prophecy. It's easy to see. It's simple. If you take the characteristics of pagan Rome and combine them with the characteristics of papal Rome, you will be establishing the characteristics of modern Rome. That's easy to see. But I'll give you one that's a little bit easier. Elijah. There are three Elijahs. The first Elijah is Elijah. The second Elijah, according to Christ, is John the Baptist, right? And the last promise of the Old Testament in Malachi is that the Lord would send Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And John the Baptist came before the day of the Lord. But the great and dreadful day of the Lord is at the end of the world. There's a promise that Elijah the third comes before the end of the world because the end of the world is the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Elijah had to deal with a threefold, a threefold enemy. An impure woman, Jezebel, that wasn't supposed to be married to a civil power, Ahab. Ahab happened to be the king of Israel, which was divided into ten nations. And the prophets of Baal, the third power, did the dance of deception. 
John the Baptist, the second Elijah. This is the triple application of prophecy. He had to deal with an impure woman, Herodias, that was not supposed to be married to the civil power, Herod. And Herodias' daughter, Salome, did the dance of deception. Well, do you, a triple application of prophecy, if you take the characteristics of the first prophecy, first fulfillment, the first line, you combine it with the characteristics of the second line, you will establish the characteristics of the third line. Therefore, Elijah and Elijah the second are identifying God's people at the end of the world. Right? Only God's people at the end of the world? Some of them don't die. That's 144,000. And some of them are going to be martyrs. John the Baptist lost his head. So you bring these two together and it's saying that God's people at the end of the world are going to consist of two classes. Some that, that are laid to rest or martyrs and some that live to the end. But it's saying that we're going to deal with the beast, which is the papacy, which is Jezebel. The church of Thyatira, which is the church of the 1260 years from 538 to 1798. The symbol of the papal, papal church in the church of Thyatira is none other than Jezebel. All right. The beast is going to marry the dragon. The dragon is the ten kings of Revelation 17. Ten kings. Ten kings. And in Revelation 17 it says these kings, these ten kings have received no kingdom. It doesn't say kingdoms. It says no kingdom. These ten kings possess one kingdom. That's the United Nations. That's why in Testimonies to Ministers, page 38, Sister White says, Kings, governors, and rulers have taken upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon that goes to make war with the saints. The dragon at the end of the world is a group of politicians. It's the United Nations. It's the civil power. It comes into an unlawful relationship with the papacy. But there's another power that's going to deceive the whole world. Revelation 13, 12 through 15 identifies the false prophet, the one that does the dance of deception, as the United States. A triple application prophecy works like this, and there's much to glean from this. I'm just simply trying to show you a triple application of prophecy, how it works. The characteristics of the first fulfillment combined with the characteristics of the second fulfillment establish the characteristics of the third and final fulfillment. Elijah and John the Baptist represents God's people at the end of the world, those that are going to die and those that aren't going to die. We're going to have to deal with the threefold union of modern Babylon, the papacy, Jezebel, the United Nations, Ahab, the United States, the false prophet. That's how it works. Okay, and there, there are several important truths that can be recognized when you use and employ a triple application of prophecy. We're going to look at one quickly as we close. <clears throat> there are three woes. It's not, it's not I that identifies three woes. Revelation 8 verse 13 says the last three trumpets are three woes. And then in chapter 9, the first two woes are set forth. If you use... Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith as your point of reference to establish the characteristics of the first woe. And, and I'm not going to draw this all out here because it's in your, your notes. But the first woe, according to the pioneers, was Islam that began in the time of Muhammad. It's pioneer understanding. Their warfare, the way they, they fought, was that they struck suddenly and un, unexpectedly. In fact, their warfare... The way that they fought is a, is a part of our history. There is a word, there is a word that we all know that is directly derived from Islam's warfare. You know what that word is? Assassin. That's where the word assassin comes from. It's, it's identifying the mode of warfare that, w that the Islamic warriors use. They strike suddenly and unexpectedly. Okay, they, don't, they don't line up in red coats like the British and French used to do. They strike suddenly and unexpectedly. And their warfare, they were carrying out their warfare in the first war against the armies of Rome. Okay, they, were in, they were engaged with Rome of Eastern and Western Rome. That's what Islam was attacking in the, the history that's covered by the first woe. And in Revelation 9.15 it says they're directed by their head and, and 
Isaiah 9.15 says, The ancient and honorable, he is the head and the prophet that teaches lies. He is the tell. Islam was guided by religious leaders that would set back behind the scenes and direct the warfares. That's one of the characteristics of Islam in the first war. Whoa. In the first war, they would hurt the armies of Rome. In the second war, they're going to kill it, kill them. There's a period in there where the, the ceiling is represented in Revelation 9, verse 4. And you can see the history there. The second war, it's Islam of Turkey. It moves to Turkey, the Ottoman Empire. Their mode of warfare is to strike suddenly and unexpectedly only in the history of the second war in 1453 when Islam blew down the walls of Constantinople and brought to an end Eastern Rome. At that battle was the first time in history that gunpowder was ever used. So the characteristics of Islam in the second war is that they strike suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives. They're also directed by their heads and the tails, which means the prophets that teach lies. Uh, and in the second war, the armies of Rome are killed. Okay, with those basics of the characteristics of the first woe and the second woe. When the third woe arrives, first off, who's it going to be? But in the first woe, it was Islam of Arabia. In the second woe, it was Islam of Turkey or the Ottoman Empire. This Islam is going to be worldwide Islam when you combine them, okay? Their mode of warfare is that they're going to strike suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives. The point of their attack is going to be the armies of Rome. Who's the armies of Rome at the end of the world? The United States. It's the armies of Rome. 9-11. The United States, the United States in Revelation 13, that's where the United States is identified, right? It comes up out of the earth. It's the earth beast. It, two, it has two horns. Republican and Protestantism, that's its, its strength. But at the end of the world, its strength isn't Republican and Protestantism. It still professes to have those horns. But what's the strength of the United States at the end of the world? Military and economic. You can't buy or sell if you don't have the mark of the beast. That's enforced by the United States. Buy or sell, that's economics. You put to death if you don't have the mark of the beast. That's military. The two strengths of the United States at the end of the world is military and economic strength. So on September 11th, do you think it's an accident that the symbol of economic strength in the United States was struck, the Twin Towers, and the symbol of military strength was struck in the Pentagon? And where'd the third plane go? Into the earth, because it's dealing with the earth beast. Brothers and sisters, that's a fulfillment of prophecy. And immediately thereafter, George Bush went to the United Nations and put a restraint upon Islam, paralleling the restraint that was placed upon Islam on August 11, 1840, when the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down. We'll spend the rest of the day dealing with this trumpet message. And the trumpet message at the end of the world is a message that those that refuse to walk in the old paths are also refusing to listen to according to Jeremiah 6, verses 16 and 17. Shall we pray? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we ask that you would come down into our hearts, into our minds, and allow us to be part of the glory that fills the earth as we represent your character to those around us. But we know that you pour your latter rain, latter rain out upon your people to first awaken them and identify our condition. Give us the discernment to understand as individuals what our condition is that we might come to the foot of the cross and be changed into your image. We ask a blessing upon our fellowship that we're going to enter into after this meeting, but we ask that you help us all to keep our thoughts and our conversations lifted up heavenward as this is the Sabbath day. And we want to keep the angels in your presence here with us and continue this blessing. We thank you for all the things you've done for us this week with this message that you're opening up to us. Please be with us now as we, we break for some physical food. In Jesus' name, amen.